wonderful experience. But I'd like to thank you all for coming this evening. We were a little bit worried with the coronavirus if we would get <laughs> how many would come, but thank you all. Um, this is the first of what we might call the centenary events that is taking place in London. 2020, centenary year. We are very much looking to run a whole series of events. But we have Michael's lecture now. We have the Dickinson lecture in two, just about two months' time, where we've got Professor Steve Ferber coming to talk about ARM and the wrist chips. Uh, events after that will be the Crofton picnic at Crofton, where the engines will be in steam. You're all very welcome to come and attend. The, the link for booking is on uh, basically the website, and we look forward to that. In the summer, in Ju early July, we have the summer tour, and this is taking place at Sheffield, and we've got you into lots of places which, whilst well, not impossible to get in as a member of the public, are not easy to get into. So you're going to see some interesting things. We're now looking at the centenary dinner, which is on the 15th of October at the National Railway Museum in York, and then we are hoping to run one or two more events after that, and we're looking forward to everybody joining us. But tonight we have the pleasure of having Michael. Michael is with the research department at Deutsche Tech Museum in Munich. Yes. Okay. And Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So my talk will be about uh, Josef von Bader. <clears throat> Josef von Bader is little known in the history of engineering. If he is occasionally mentioned in historical studies, this is because of his rivalry with Georg von Reichenbach. And Reichenbach is famous for making precision instruments. While Reichenbach entered the Encyclopedia Britannica as German instrument maker, the editors of this prestigious encyclopedia did not consider Josef von Bader worthy of a biographical account. Unlike his younger brother Franz von Bader, whom the encyclopedia portrayed as a famous German theologian, Josef von Bader's achievements in engineering have not been rated important enough to secure him a place in history. So why do I dedicate this lecture to a Bavarian engineer who left no landmarks in the history of technology? I should stress at the outset that I do not attempt to rectify Bader's neglect as a pioneer of engineering by embellishing his achievements. Nor do I rate Bader's inventions as technological failures like some of his critics. My aim is rather to shed light on Bader's effort to bring the benefits of the Industrial Revolution from Great Britain to pre-industrial Bavaria. In other words, Bader's case will illustrate engineering on a lost point, on a lost post. As a perhaps surprising result, we will encounter an unusual setting for the presentation of Bader's inventions. But let me start with a biographical sketch. Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, how this, this is here. <clears throat> Josef Bader was one of 13 children, of which six died at a very young age. Josef, born in 1763, followed the wish of his father, a doctor, at the electoral court and studied medicine. He finished his studies in 1785 with a doctorate in medicine. Thereafter, he continued his studies at the University of Göttingen, where he attended lectures of the famous physicist Georg Christoph Lichtenberg. Then he moved on to the University of Edinburgh, where he became influenced by Joseph Black, John Robison, and John Playfair. Externally, his studies in Göttingen and Edinburgh appeared as a broadening of his medical studies. Both Lichtenberg and Black had strong affiliations to physicians. Black served for some time as president of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, and Joseph Bader too did not dissociate himself from medicine abruptly, 
In March 1787, he became a member of the Royal Medical Society of Edinburgh, perhaps at the suggestion of Joseph Black, who was an honorary member of the society. Under the spell of the Industrial Revolution, however, Bader no longer pursued a career as a physician. He stayed on the British Isles until 1794, interrupted only by a trip home in 1790. By this time, he already considered engineering as his true profession. His first accomplishment in this area concerned the blower of blast furnaces, on which he published a treatise then in 1794. After his return to Munich in the same year, he was employed by the court as superintendent of machines. Two years later, he became member of the Bavarian Academy of Science. In 1798, he was promoted to a higher rank, principal of machines and court counselor, so this was his, his title. In this capacity, he had to supervise the hydraulic machines for the water supply of the electoral castle parks. His responsibility also comprised the machineries of the salt, mint, and mining <coughs> facilities. In 1808, Arthur was knighted. By then, he was at the climax of his career as the leading chief engineer in Bavaria. Among his most achieved, praised, among <coughs> his most praised achievements were new hydraulic facilities for, the, for driving fountain sets at the Nymphenburg Castle Park. You can see this later. In 1813, Bader's official title was Josef von Bader, Superior Councillor of Mining and Water Supply of the Court, Knight of the Order of Merits of the Bavarian Crown. In 1815, Bader departed for another sojourn of several months to England where he studied the most recent technological advances. Like 20 years before, the British experience sparked his own engineering creativity. Once more, he attempted to bring new technologies to Bavaria, such as steam engines, gas light, and railways. But these efforts were doomed to failure. In the meantime, Bader's appreciation at home had begun to wane. <clears throat> his quick temper and strong ego made him many enemies among his fellow academics, in particular Georg von Reichenbach, whom he had regarded as his pupil and friend during his first sojourn in Britain. I will come to this later. In 1820, Bader's responsibility was confined to hydraulic machinery and confined to hydraulic machinery only, separated from the administration for mining and salt works, which was earlier his uh, responsibility too. But this did not prevent Bader from inventing new technology beyond hydraulics. In 1822, he published a richly illustrated treatise on a new system of mechanical transport with which he suggested the transport of carriages on iron rails hauled by horses. So not steam locomotives, but normal horses. As a result of his untiring struggle for a rail-based transport system, he was regarded as a railway pioneer in Germany for some time. Arthur promoted his pet projects with ever-increasing zeal as becomes evident by a search of press articles in the 1820s. Beyond railways, he made headlines with improvements for fire extinguishers, steam engines, or merely as a tart critic of his own critics. In 1832, he retired from his official duties. Three years later, he died in Munich after a life full of frustrations and lost struggles. Even his obituary admits that his numerous feuds with academic colleagues had, I quote, not always been performed with the delicateness 
with which scientific opinions should be defended or refuted. <laughs> in the following, I pursue Bader's career as an engineer in order to present a contextual historical view of his inventions. I start with Bader's sojourn in Edinburgh in the late 1780s, where he received his first inspirations for his future career. Bader's first encounter with British inventions may have happened already at Göttingen in Lichtenberg's lectures. Quote, if there is a machine which does credit to the human mind, it is the steam engine. This was how Lichtenberg made steam engines the subject of his lectures on natural philosophy. The nature of heat became a natural topic of debate in this context. It is therefore not accidental that Bader chose the University of Edinburgh as his subsequent destination, where Joseph Black had played a crucial role for the invention of James Watt's steam engine. With the current ironworks at Falkirk in the neighborhood, he was also close to one of the birthplaces of the Industrial Revolution. When Bader saw the giant blowing machines for the blast furnaces at Carron, he became inspired for what became his first invention. A blowing, a blowing engine. Instead of pistons moving in huge cast iron cylinders with considerable friction, Bader's machine avoided this friction by moving up and down into a container filled with water. So for this reason it was called hydrostatic blowing engine. So here you see the water and this is the, the, the vessel which, which pushes downwards. <coughs> Bader's machine avoided this friction uh, by moving an open container into a vessel filled with water. When the container was pushed downwards, the enclosed air above the water surface would be pressurized and ejected through an attached pipe towards the furnace. So this was the principle. At the suggestion of his professors, Joseph Black and, and Playfair mainly, Bader built a model in order to demonstrate the principle of this blowing engine. Subsequently, he elaborated his ideas into a treatise. For a while, Bader pondered even on applying for a patent in London, but he abstained from this idea because he did not expect that his invention could compete with the recently introduced British blowing engines. In German ironworks, however, air was blown into the furnaces still by bellows like centuries ago. So Bader hoped that his invention would modernize German ironworks, and not entirely in vain. When a few years later a fire destroyed an ironwork at Weyerhammer in Upper Palatinate, Bader's blowing engine was installed for the new blast furnace. The quality of the cast iron from this furnace Quote, proved the advantages of Bader's cylindrical blower, as a newspaper reported about this first successful application. Even decades later, Bader's blowing engine was regarded worth of an entry in textbooks and encyclopedias of mechanical engineering. At Edinburgh, Bader became so much inspired by the new technologies of the Industrial Revolution that he gave up medicine and ventured on a career in mechanical engineering. His professors, Black and Robinson, counted among the closest supporters of James Watt. I take the liberty of introducing to you acquaintance Dr. Bader, a young gentleman who has been at this university for two or three years. This is how Robinson wrote to Watt in March 1789. He praised Bader for his strong predilection for mechanical engineering. Next to what, Bader became personally acquainted also with the legendary iron master John Wilkinson. And what and Wilkinson then recommended Bader to the Earl of Balcaris, who was looking by this time for an engineer to whom he could entrust the 
reorganization of his ironworks at Hague near Wigan in Lancashire. Arthur obviously impressed the Earl and was entrusted with the management of the entire enterprise. But before Arthur took up this new responsibility at Hague in 1791, he interrupted his sojourn in Britain for a visit at home. Bavaria was then combined with Palatinate and ruled by the elector Karl Theodor from Palatinate's capital Mannheim. The elector's most influential advisor, Benjamin Thompson, better known as Count Rumford, suggested to order a steam engine for Mannheim's water supply. Or so it should appear to Matthew Bolton and James Watt, because Rumford used Bader as mediator for this order. The steam engine was supposed to be used not only for raising water, but also for mills and for a fountain jet, as Bader wrote to Bolton and Watt. Quote, Besides, it is the wish of the elector to have a small jet of water, playing at times about 50 or 60 feet high above the ground, which, I presume, might be obtained by two forcing pumps with an air vessel, to which the power of the engine could be applied occasionally. I hope to have the pleasure of paying you my visit at Birmingham in a few weeks, and shall bring with me a young smith from this country, whom the elector intends to send over to you, in order that you may instruct him to put up and keep the engine." So this was the, the letter how father uh, started to introduce Reichenbach, because the young smith was the 19-year-old Reichenbach, Georg Reichenbach, the son of a master cannon borer and artillery lieutenant in Mannheim. Young Reichenbach was educated at the Mannheim Military School and, according to an official document from May 1791, sent with a grant from the Mannheim military budget to England, quote, in order to bring his mechanical art to perfection. But from the available archival material, it is not clear whether this order, the order of a steam engine, was merely a pretense for industrial espionage. Bolton seems to have entertained a suspicion from the very beginning in view of earlier experience with foreign visitors. When Bader and Reichenbach arrived at Soho, they were received in a chilly atmosphere, as Reichenbach recorded in his diary. On July 10, 1791, he wrote, Mr. Bader explained to Mr. Bolton why I had come namely in order to study the mechanism of Watt's fire engine. However, he did not appear pleased about that, for his, for his character is very secretive. <coughs> Nevertheless, Bolton and Watt granted Reichenbach access to their factory. And once admitted access, Reichenbach studied the mechanism of Watt's steam engine in greater detail than necessary for its operation. He entered in his diary, and I'll show you a picture of his diary, which is preserved in the Dutch's Museum in Munich. I worked for six weeks on my drawings, for I had to conceal this not only from Bolton, but also from the workmen here. For this reason, this work gave me trouble more than words can say not only because I could not ask anyone in order to raise no suspicion, but also because I could see the engine only at times. A few weeks later, however, Rumford cancelled the order of the steam engine. Bolton was upset about this father entered in his diary and denied me further access to the factory, which I had enjoyed only because of this order. Now, subsequently, Reichenbach moved on to Wigan, where Bader had in the meantime started his new job as manager of the Hague Ironworks. There are contradictory accounts about Bader's and Reichenbach's activities at Hague. It seems that the, problem with the, management were, the problems with the management were too much for Bader. 
As the steward of the Earl once reported, Bader did not care whether matters sink or swim. Reichenbach apparently used the opportunity to learn more about steam engines. He dismantled one which was used for a blast furnace and left it in pieces. By January 1793, Bader's and Reichenbach's association with the Hague Ironworks had come to an end. The manager was employed, a new manager was employed, and later reproached again for incompetence. However, there were other circumstances that contributed to the decline of the enterprise, such as the bad quality of the local coal. The history of the Hague Ironworks is too complex and the archival record too sketchy for blaming one or another manager for its fate. Whatever Bader and Reichenbach may have experienced in the factory of Bolton and Watt, the Hague Ironworks, and elsewhere in Great Britain, they acquired an intimate knowledge about steam engines and blast furnaces at the birthplaces of the Industrial Revolution. Whether this experience is rated as industrial espionage or not, it provided them with unique machine knowledge from which they hoped to benefit in their future careers at home. In the following, I focus again on Bader. Uh, Reichenbach's story would be subject for another uh, separate study. In Bavaria, there were few opportunities for a mechanical engineer to exert this profession, if mechanical engineering may be called a profession by the late 18th century. The industrial age arrived in Bavaria only decades later. Yet, the tacit and explicit knowledge about machines that Bader had acquired in England and Scotland became an asset for his career. When he returned to Munich in 1794, he was immediately employed by the state administration for mining and minting as superintendent of machines. In this capacity, he introduced a few years later his blowing engine in an ironwork in the Upper Palatinate. I mentioned this earlier. His expert knowledge of blowing engines served him also as an entry into the Bavarian Academy of Science, which had a very utilitarian orientation at this time, like most academies. By 1800, Bader characterized himself as, quote, court counselor and director of all waterworks and machines in Bavaria and Upper Palatinate, member of the Electoral Bavarian Academy of Science in Munich and the Royal Medical Society in Edinburgh. As this characterization indicates, Bader did not content himself with earning his money as an officer at the Electoral Court with mere administrative tasks. Within a few years, he published treatises on pumps, on the recent progress of machine technology and on engines for water raising in, for water raising in mines and salt works. So these are the title pages of these uh, three treatises published in short sequence in 1797, 98 and 1800. Thus he made himself a name as an academic who regarded machine knowledge as his true mission. Bader shared this mission with like-minded academics from other countries, like Gaspar Pony from Paris, who was famous for a treatise on hydraulics. Bader informed Pony in autumn 1797 about his own book on pumps in order to demonstrate his own expert knowledge in this field. He also recommended Pony as corresponding member of the Bavarian Academy of Science. Quote, the scholars of all countries are compatriots, Bader wrote to Bruni. They form a huge republic, that of science and art. Another academic with expert knowledge on hydraulics and machines was Karl Christian Langsdorff. Like Bruni and Bader, Langsdorff aimed at with his treatises on practical application. Unlike Bruni, however, Langstaff was regarded by Bader as a rival. 
he reproached Langstorff for literary plundering, because Langstorff had published in, uh, in his own book a description of Bader's blowing engine without giving credit to Bader as the inventor. In this dispute, Bader displayed for the first time what became a recurrent reaction when he felt that his own achievements were not properly acknowledged by others. The machine knowledge a la Langstorff and Bader may be illustrated by the treatment of the air vessel or pressurized tank. The principle was simple and known since antiquity as Heron's fountain. By the 18th century, it was mainly applied in fire engines. And here you see one example from Billy Dorf's treatise in 1737. <clears throat> where the, the, the air vessel is, oops, the air vessel is here, uh, and these are the pumps, and the air vessel uh, causes a regular uh, flow of water. But its practical application for water racing had to wait for the late 18th century, because it required the mastery of cast iron and valve gear. Both Langstorff and Bader's treatises account for this innovation with detailed schemes, how it may be combined with pumps for water raising. And this is seen here uh, in Langstorff treatise. So the, the, the air vessel is uh, combined in various ways with the pumps and it serves the same purpose, to create a steady flow of water. <coughs> and here you see the same principle used in, in Bader Streets in water pumps. So the central uh, instrument is always this air vessel, like here. It is worth to note that this literature on machines preceded the establishment of engineering schools in Germany. Some authors of this literature became professors and propagated this knowledge to students who may then be regarded as the first generation of professionally trained engineers in Germany. Bavaria, however, was lagging behind other German states in this regard. So Bader exerted no such role for the professionalization of engineering in Germany. Yet there were other opportunities for Bader to excel as an engineer. In 1800, the Bavarian elector assigned his garden architect Friedrich Ludwig Skell to transform the Baroque garden at his summer castle in Nymphenburg into a landscape garden following the creation of the English garden in Munich a few years before. In the same vein, the water art should be renewed. According to an inventory from the year 1789, there were more than 600 running and springing waters in the Baroque garden. And this multitude should be replaced now by only two fountains with impressive jets on both sides of the castle. To this end, the fountain houses had to be equipped with a new hydraulic machinery, just the technology on which Bader had focused in his treatises. The water supply for the fountains was provided by canals. <coughs> which had to be dammed at appropriate sites in order to propel water wheels. So this is one of the fountain houses as it looked like in the 18th century. The water wheels are driven from, from canals uh, with, with, with a little height difference of about two meters or so. <coughs> the water wheels drove pumps which raised water into elevated reservoirs like here, like here on top of water towers at the fountain houses. 
the pressure which resulted from the height difference between the ground and the reservoirs enabled the ejection of fountain jets all over in the park. Bader scheme did not require new canals for the water supply, but it could dispense of the water towers. And this is, you can recognize the same, the same building but without the water towers. So this is uh, how it uh, was renewed around 1800. Instead of the elevated reservoirs, the water was pumped into air vessels made of cast iron. This is a drawing uh, where you see the, the, the air vessel. And in, in the background, which you cannot see, is about other water wheels which turn around this uh, part of the machine and elevate it in, uh, up and down. Uh, the pump piston. <clears throat> With these air vessels, a higher pressure could be obtained uh, than from the old water towers, which therefore became superfluous. On 27 May 1804, Arthur presented the new machinery to the elector. The fountain jet was 76 feet high, a newspaper reported about this event. The machine worked easy and smoothly. Under the previous government, the jet operated from the water tower was only 34 feet high. End of quote. Two years later, when Bavaria was elevated by Napoleon to a kingdom, Bader received a royal decree of appreciation and a gratification of a hundred louis d'or, which was quite an amount of money at the time. And Napoleon was also very much impressed by the Nymphenburg fountain. He asked Bader to develop a scheme for improving the famous Machine de Marly. Oh, this is how it, it looks uh, like. I, I should have shown this slide before. So this was a sketch around 1800. And this is the same, the same vessel uh, today. And this is in the, in the neighboring fountain house, also the air vessel. And this is the famous machine, the Marly, as it looked like in, in the uh, early 18th century. <coughs> uh, it, it had a very bad uh, efficiency, and father, in his own uh, this about the, the machine which he suggested to replace uh, for the old machine of Marly. He compared the efficiency of the old machine of Marly to his, his own as 1 to 18, so almost 20, 20 fold uh, stronger. Bader's plan for a new machine at Marly, however, did not materialize. By 1810, however, he had renewed the machinery in the second fountain house in Nymphenburg, which drove the fountain jet in front of the castle, facing towards Munich, also to considerable heights. So now, this is the principle of the, sec of the, of the second fountain house. I have to explain this. The water flows in from, from left to right. It is guided in a uh, uh, in a bassin, and from there it feeds three water wheels and so overshot uh, water wheels. And uh, here you see again the air vessel and the pumps. So this, these are the air vessels. And the same, oops, the same machine is still. Uh, uh, can be visited today. This is how it looks from the side. Here you see the pumps. Oops. The pumps and in, in between the... Uh, you, can, you cannot see very well the, the air vessels, but you will see them in, in the video at the end of, of the presentation. And this is the fountain jet. 
And uh, what you just have seen, this fountain house, is uh, in this part of the castle. So from the outside you will not, you, you will not guess that uh, in, the, in the interior there is this machinery. <coughs> the reports about the exact height of, of the fountain jets differ. Quote, in quiet weather the fountain jet reaches 90 feet high and keeps this height. This was how Bada estimated in 1806 uh, the fountain jet. According to an account by the superintendent of the Nymphenburg Park 30 years later, the two jets driven by Bada's machinery were, quote, the most powerful and highest in Europe driven by machine pressure. An international encyclopedia of gardening described Bauer's achievement in 1835 in a similar manner. These gardens contain two of the finest jets of water in Germany. Bauer's engineering activity at Nymphenburg was not limited to hydraulic machinery. On 30 August 1810, a newspaper reported about an invention <coughs> which Bader had presented to the king the day before on the waters of the park. Quote, one may call this machine a swimming chair on the water or a water stretch. So, this is from Ludon's uh, 1835 Encyclopedia of Gardening. <clears throat> it consisted of two hollow pontoons made from copper on which a platform with a chair and a desk was mounted. From the chair, a person could move two pedals, which would propel the boat forward like the feet of ducks. As described in the Annalen de Physique, the flapping rudder was completely similar to the feet of water birds. Today we would call this an early example of bionics. Bader must have hit upon this idea when he observed the ducks and geese on the waters of the park. The water sledge became also a public attraction. A newspaper <coughs> praised it as follows. This machine combines the common pleasure of traveling on water with the comforts of easy and healthy exercise and the advantage of being independent of an annoying guide. <laughs> The individual traveller could enjoy the promenade upon the water with, quote, reading, writing, drawing, eating, drinking, playing a violin or guitar, always charging or shooting a gun when it is used for hunting. According to Ludon's Encyclopedia of Gardening, visitors of Nymphenburg could still in 1835 enjoy a ride on the waters of the park with Bader's water sledge during the summer season. Nevertheless, the water sledge remained a singular curiosity. Up to our days, almost 200 years later, when it served as subject of a reconstruction at an engineering school. Another technology on display at Nymphenburg for some time was gas light. In 1815, Bader traveled once more to London for an extended stay of several months, this time in the company of the mechanic who had collaborated with him in order to install the hydraulic machinery at Nymphenburg. At this occasion, they witnessed the rise of gaslight. <coughs> the details of this new technology could also be studied from the recent treatise from the pen of Friedrich Christian Ackermann a chemist who had emigrated from Germany to England many years ago and then became a pioneer of, of gas lighting in Europe. When Bader and his mechanic returned to Munich, they were eager to demonstrate the virtues of gas light with a small test facility. A visitor of the park reported in a newspaper how surprised he was, quote, to hit upon a totally successful trial of gas light 
during a promenade in the castle park at Münchenburg. It was probably closely following the design described in, in Akum's treatise, like here. The coal gas was produced from local stone coal and, according to a newspaper report, did not spread the slightest odor. The light was, quote, very bright and white. A few days later, Bardo presented the test facility to the king and his family. Quote, his royal majesties appreciated this first successful trial. A newspaper reported about this event and expressed the hope that an illumination of this kind will soon be realized on a large scale. Another trial demonstration of new technology concerns steam engines. In 1816, Reichenbach performed experiments with high-pressure steam engines with the goal to reduce their size. Reichenbach aimed at the use of steam engines for transportation. By this time, Reichenbach and Bader had become rancorous rivals. Bader ridiculed Reichenbach's steam crock. It would immediately get stuck on Cannon Road's field. Furthermore, the risk of boiler explosions made the use of high-pressure steam engines too dangerous. Bader too aimed at smaller steam engines, but not for transportation. In January 1821, he presented to an agricultural commission at Nymphenburg a steam engine, quote, of a very simple and cheap construction, but without disclosing more details. He never claimed that his steam engine could be applied for all kinds of machinery. Subsequently, Bader installed the steam engine in a Munich vinegar factory where it was used for raising water. He praised it as the first successfully working steam engine in Bavaria, which is not to be taken too serious because there were many trials at that time. It seems to have worked for several weeks, according to a newspaper report. But no technical details were disclosed except that it must have differed considerably from Watt's steam engine. A year later, Arthur presented another invention a steam wheel, and this was not his last trial to make himself a name for improving steam engine technology. But nothing is left from these efforts, nor are they mentioned in the authoritative history of steam engines published in 1901 by Konrad Machos, the Nestor of the History of Technology in Germany and Director of the Verein Deutscher Ingenieure. In an age of German nationalism, Machos would certainly not have missed the opportunity to praise Bader as a German pioneer if Bader's steam engines had proved themselves in practice. Although Bader polemized vehemently against mobile steam engines, he became a proponent of railways. As early as in 1801, he regarded an iron railroad according to the English invention as a more favorable means of transportation for salt than a canal. In the following years, he elaborated a sophisticated dual-use system of transportation. <clears throat> he invented carriages with additional wheels for use on iron rails and on normal roads. They would be hauled by horses, as you can see here, like boats on a canal, not by steam locomotives. For this purpose, iron rails would have to be laid alongside ordinary roads upon stone dams, together with special devices for changing from rail to road and from rail to rail at crossings. In 1814, he announced a treatise with copper plates uh, with copper plate engravings that would display all the details of this railroad invention. And these are all examples from, from these copper plate engravings. Thus he aimed for subscriptions that allowed him to finance the expensive copper plate engravings. 
In the meantime, Bade installed a model railroad in his house in Munich in order to demonstrate the virtues of small friction when the wheels of a carriage move on rails. A load of 300 pounds could be hauled on horizontal rails by a weight of only one and a half pounds. He concluded from such model trials that one horse could haul on iron railroads as much as 36 horses on ordinary roads. According to a newspaper report, Bader performed these model trials in the presence of men from upper echelons, including a various powerful minister at the time, Maximilian von Mogilov. The Russian Emperor Alexander I too witnessed such trials during the visit of Munich in May 1815. He was so impressed that he subscribed 400 copies of Bader's forthcoming treatise. But it took another few years of trial experiments and lobbying before influential circles until the announced treatise was published. The main purpose for Bader's voyage to London in 1815 was to present his railway invention to renowned British colleagues like the president of the Royal Society, Sir Joseph Banks, and the engineer John Rennie, famous for design of bridges, for the design of bridges. He also applied for a royal patent for London, for England, which indeed was issued on 14 November 1815. The patent ascertained his priority not only for specific rails and carriages, but also for steam engines, water wheels, and any other machinery for stationary use at points where the carriages would be hauled up over inclined passages. He explicitly contrasted these stationary engines from locomotive engines or steam horses, which had been used occasionally at that time already in England. The climax of Bader's railway propaganda came in 1825, when an area in the Nymphenburg Castle Park was put at his disposal for real sized trials. The Nymphenburg performance made railways a subject of public debate. Newspaper articles praised Bader as a pioneer of railway transport. In view of Bader's very known suggestions, quote, uh, and important trials about the perfection of railways, one newspaper informed its readers that, quote, in all probability, the long debated transportway between the rivers Danube and Maine would be realized by rails. So this was an old dispute to connect the two rivers, Danube and Maine, with a canal or with a railway now. The Nymphenburg railway trials also became the subject of expert opinions. Some evaluated Bader's railway system favorably, but a commission chaired by the king's architect Leo von Glenze rated Bader's railway inventions in particular his mechanisms for uphill and downhill transport as utterly useless. Glenze was the authoritative figure in building matters and his devastating verdict prevented further efforts to implement Bader's railway system. It was not given preference as a more economic transport way over a canal between the rivers Danube and Maine. The first railway in Bavaria between the cities Nuremberg and Fürth in 1835 also did not make use of Bader's system, but rather imported this technology from England. Bader's failure invites further inquiries. With regard to the alternative transport ways, canal versus railway, Bader kept fighting for the cause of railways up to his death. But he was on a lost post since the king, Ludwig I, preferred the canal, not least for military reasons. How easily railroads can be destroyed in a war, the king once wrote to the Minister of the Interior. Another reason for Bader's failures was his temper. His entire career was accompanied by fierce rivalries. 
Most of his feuds were carried out in the form of published articles. And once a series of back and forth exchanges about the disputed innovation of Bader at Saltworks was closed in this way, quote, the publishers of this journal hereby declare the battlefield closed and ask the gentlemen gladiators to choose another arena. <laughs> A particularly vehement feud arose about prime pipelines in the Bavarian Alps, for which Reichenbach became the leading engineer. By 1811, the field climaxed. Even a Berlin newspaper reported about the rudeness which was now reigning between the former friends. Bader's fiery temper made it difficult to collaborate with him, all from the perspective of, his state, of the state authorities to cope with his idiosyncrasy. By the early 1820s, his responsibilities were confined to hydraulic machinery. Thereafter, his engineering efforts in other areas became his private venture. At the same time, the building administration in Bavaria was reorganized. Bader's department was placed under the authority of Klenze, and Klenze sided with Reichenbach in the field between the two rivals. In a letter to Reichenbach, Klenze called Bader an, quote, insect brimming of venom. In the Bavarian Academy of Science, too, Bader had made himself enemies. In 1821, the Academy's collection of technical models was placed under a new directorship, although Bader had been its curator since its beginnings. Bader reacted with anger and rancor. In a letter to the Crown Prince, he complained about the insatiable ambition and boundless jealousy of Reichenbach, whom he blamed for denying him the responsibility for mining, iron and salt works my areas of excellence, Father Lord. He apologized for the aggressive tone in some of his public articles, but he presented himself as the victim and not the aggressor. Quote, I have not been put back and maltreated because my tongue and face are were sharp, but these have become sharp because I have been put back and maltreated undeservedly. In the same letter to the Crown Prince, he threatened to resign from the academy, which he considered his last refuge, where he had demonstrated his capacity since 30 years ago. Then, however, he wrote, I will also, for my public justification, make known the reasons which forced me to take this step in all foreign scholarly journals. Thus, he threatened to make this maltreatment public. And this mixture of complaint and threat will not have brought Bader any sympathy from his superiors. The king had sided with Reichenbach from the very beginning. Reichenbach, why must you be dead to me, he sighed in 1829, a few years after Reichenbach's death, when the dispute about the canal railway alternative boiled up again. Since his days as crown prince, he did not like Bader. After Bader's gaslight demonstration at Nymphenburg, he had pondered to illuminate the royal residence in Munich in this way. But he asked Glenze to contract with Reichenbach and not with Bader for this project. However, these plans were not put into practice. Gaslight was introduced in Munich only decades later. In the same vein, Bader's suggestions to improve Munich's water supply by using the steam engine, were discarded. He remarked in despair at this occasion in 1824, for my part, I have long been so accustomed to seeing all my inventions, ideas and plans discarded or shelved, that it will not surprise me if this proposal, as important and plausible as it is, should meet the same fate. Let me come to the conclusion with an answer to the questions which I raised in the introduction. What makes it worthwhile to study Bader's case? A good deal of his engineering ventures ended in blind alleys. 
This does not mean that the industrial age would have arrived earlier in Bavaria if Bade had been more successful in achieving his goals. If England is regarded as the center of the Industrial Revolution, Bavaria represented a part of the periphery. Invention does not entail innovation if the environment is not prepared for its implementation. Failure was to be expected, be it steam engines, gaslight or railways. Each of these technologies require for its broad application an appropriate infrastructure, which was not available in Bavaria during Bader's lifetime. The successful demonstration of Bader's engineering skills, such as the hydraulic machinery at Nymphenburg, does not contradict, but rather confirm this conclusion. This refers to the scene of Bader's engineering activity, the castle park. This was a unique environment for presenting new technology like in a showcase. It is not accidental that the Nymphenburg Castle Park was not only the site for new hydraulic machinery, but also the setting for Bader's demonstration of steam engines, gaslight and railways. The Royal Garden served as a pre-industrial proving ground for new technology. And this is perhaps the most striking lesson from this story. I have elaborated uh, this lesson in more detail in my recent book. Royal parks are admired for their splendid garden architecture from the vantage point of art history. Bader's case shows that they also deserve the curiosity of historians of technology, all the more if this old technology is still working like in the Nymphenburg Castle Park. And now, please could you show the two video sequences? So, this gives you an impression of how uh, fast the, the machines are working. This is the air vessel. And in the second video, you see the same the, the machinery which you have seen in one slide in the other fountain house. So now it's overshot water wheels which drive the pumps. And again, you see the, the, the air vessel. This is the air vessel between the piston moving in the pumps. So if you come to Munich and uh, in, in summertime, do not miss the opportunity to, to visit this fountain house. So it's really worth a visit. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you for an absolutely fascinating and wonderful talk. It was, it was brilliant. I think it's very, very easy to forget the extent to which technology transfer took place in that period. And it's something that uh, perhaps in Britain we, we don't appreciate that this technology transfer was very much two way. So the idea of canals in England, they make out that we, we invented canals, but we didn't. We imported the technology. And likewise, the technology on ironworking was exported. When I went to Nymphenburg Castle, two things struck me, and, and I, I, this, I'd like to bring these out. Firstly, the very, very efficient way that the, the limited water supply was used. The, the, the available crossfall on the site was probably no more than five metres in the best part of a kilometre. So, it was very, so basically, the two engines were the upper ones have got about two metres fall, the other ones have got nearly three metres fall. But more importantly than that, it was when you looked at the quality of the castings. Um, for those of you who are going to be a little bit um, derogatory towards Bolton and Watts, there was a lot of criticism of the quality of Bolton and Watts castings. Castings uh, that were coming out of Lancashire and to a greater extent in Yorkshire was seen as higher quality. 
And this was a, a change in technology from loam casting, uh, casting in loam, to green sand casting. The quality of the castings here, when I first saw them until Michael said, I'd placed them 50 or 60 years later than the actual date. It's exceptionally high quality. The finish on them is, is I won't say incredible, but it's very, very high. But what you see also is very much um, a continuation of the Bolton and Watt theme, because you have circular columns, which is very indicative of Bolton and Watt and Lancashire practice and Yorkshire practice. And it is uh, fascinating to see the workmanship of that date. And I think that's something. But at this point, can we throw it open to, to questions from yourself? Do we have it? Frank. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, that was really interesting about somebody who I'm afraid to say I've never heard of until your talk. Um, could you say a bit more about the involvement of the Bavarian monarchy um, in this? Because are they deliberately pursuing a policy of seeing if we can industrialise and bring ourselves up to sort of British and French standards? Yes. You, mentioned, you mentioned in passing the Napoleon's um, occupation. Uh, of, of Bavaria and sort of Bavaria becoming a client state. Um, is this part of the response that if we can sort of improve our technology, improve our engineering practice, we might be able to stay more uh, occupation by France in the future? Is, this, is, is that sort of thinking going on there somewhere? Yes. Well, uh, in, in Bavaria, before 1806, Bavaria uh, had ele electors uh, and uh, in uh, Napoleon raised, uh, elevated Bavaria to a kingdom in 1806. So only after 1806, uh, Bavaria was a kingdom, and the kings uh, pursued roughly the same policy like the electors before. So it was always a state-centered uh, fostering of, of technology, uh, and. Uh, in, in the later period, the kings apparently differed in, in, in their opinion about the, the, the value of, of technology. Uh, the first king, uh, Max the I, uh, apparently did not too much appreciate technology. Ludwig the I, his son, uh, was very much interested in technology and uh, he, for example, he, he uh, suggested to Glenze that Glenze should uh, get very close to, to uh, the gaslight because he wanted this gaslight in, in the residence in, in, in Munich. Uh, but then uh, there was no coherent policy of, 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 of the king, so I have the impression it, the policy changed like the moods of, of the king, except for the canal, uh, the king was uh, uh, really uh, quite strong that he, he favoured the canal and not the railway. And for the railway also, when the first railway was built in, 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 in 1835, uh, actually the same year when Bader died, uh, but those who, who favoured the railway wanted that the railway is named after the king in order to elevate the railway. And for this reason, it, actually, it is called Ludwigsbahn uh, between Nürnberg and, and Fürth. But the canal also was called Ludwig's Canal. The, the, the king didn't like the railway, but he didn't uh, oppose uh, that his name was used for the railway. So if you do not know this, you could get the impression that the king, Ludwig I, uh, was in favour of the railway, of the canal, he enthusiastically uh, uh, was, was uh, wanted to have new technology in the area. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? Can I ask about the gas shape? Because it's an extraordinary, I mean, it's an extraordinarily early demonstration of gaslighting outside this country. And of course what interests me is that Vincer and Apple were both German 
And so the British gas industry is based on German expertise, and then it's exported back to Germany by Bayer. Is it, did, did he just, do you know, um, reproduce the, the material, you know, the, 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 the kit that Ackham described in those books? Or did he, in fact, experiment further with that? Does one know? Well, according to the newspaper reports, uh, are they used exactly Ackham's uh, uh, scheme? Mm. And, but there is nothing really published about further experiments of, of gas. Uh, there were plans of, uh, to, to use gas light for the residents, both by Reichenbach and both by Bader. Uh, and what I have seen, I have nothing seen from Bader's side, but from Reichenbach's side, it again used very much or modified only little Ackham's uh, scheme. Mm -hmm. But this also was only a plan, it, it remained a plan. But I, sh I, sh I should mention that Bader came exactly at the time to London in 1815, exactly. when Ackham's uh, Excuse. Was realized, yeah. Yes, no, absolutely. No, I mean, that's really interesting. Do, do you know, um, within the sort of context, I mean, was it the first application of, of German English technology outside England? I mean, what about, because I think France was introducing gaslighting later a little bit. Yes. Do you know, do you know where it lies <coughs> in the scheme of? of the European introduction yes. gas. What makes the case of gaslight so, so difficult is that between 1815 and the realization of gaslight, the actual real implementation of gaslight in Munich, for example, in Munich it, it was implemented in 1850, 35 really? years later. I mean, I mean, in various other German countries, gaslight came earlier, but Munich was really late. That's extraordinary. Yes, yes. It just shows you should never be ahead of your time. Because time is, I suppose, ahead of his time. Yeah. And it, can I, while well, I'm at it, ask one more question about Reichenbach, who's somebody whose name I know, and I've had one or two odd publications of his. You, I may have misunderstood what you said, but the thing that you were saying about the steam locomotive and it did or didn't work on common roads, is that is that a road locomotive or a railway locomotive, is that it? Is that yes, well, Reichenbach initially really wanted to, to have locomotives moving on normal roads. Yes. Uh, not on rails. So Reichenbach, Reichenbach died too early to become a railway uh, enthusiast. He died in, in 1926, I guess. Uh, and he was uh, entrusted with the canal plan. Uh, in, in, in the early 1820s. So Reichenbach never became really heavy, heavily engaged in, in, in railways, but he wanted to improve steam engines and make steam engines smaller and apply steam engines for uh, <coughs> normal road transport. Because there's quite a long history of it in this country. I mean, it started yes. with Trevithick in 1803, yes. and then there's sort of gap, and then it picked up again in the very yes. early 1820s. I have no idea, I'm just ignorant, I guess. I have no idea that actually they, there were other countries also thinking yeah. about road locomotives, so it's perfectly logical when you think about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's just that none of us speak German, so how would we know? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in this dispute between Reichenbach and Bader, if, if I may add this, uh, Bader uh, was, was, was using the, the British examples of, of, of railway uh, locomotion, uh, of, 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 of steam, steam horses, he, uh, he said. So he used one, one accident as an example, where many people were, were killed and, and many uh, injured. How dangerous this technology still is. So he, he warned that Reichenbach's uh, steam horse should not become reality. It's actually when you look at the, the railway pictures um, his drawings of the railway, you can actually see similarities to several of the early railway designs around here. Mm -hmm. And he's over in 1815, this suggests strongly that he's coming to see um, John Rennie. He must have probably looked at the 
Surrey Iron Railway at that date, which was what, 10 years old at that point, mm -hmm. which is using iron blocks and rails of a very similar design to that. Oh, they were using sort of fish yeah. bellies. Yeah, mm -hmm. fish bellies rails. Mm -hmm. So you, you can see the themes there, that, that how the technology was transferred. Mm -hmm. any, any more questions? No? <laughs> I mean, they actually need, sorry, like the question. <laughs> I mean, there's the widespread of his communications. I mean, the fact that he was communicating with Prony, who was one of the great, great, great French engineers, and Nouvelle Architecture de Rolique is one of, you know, is in fact the first great illustrations of, of beam engines in, in France, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's extraordinary that he had this sort of wide communications, yes. and with what Bolton and what, but I mean, particularly with the French people, and I mean, is that, again, is that typical of a, of a, of a European engineer, does one know? Whew, I don't know, but it's typical. Because Bader's case is, is in, in some regards really unusual because he was such a difficult character. Mm. He, he, had, he had rivalries with, with everybody. And so I hesitate to say that Bader's case is typical. Nevertheless, it, it displays features which are not uncommon at, at the time. Mm. No, it's the, it's the German, it's the German part that for us remains totally hidden. Sorry, I'll stop going on. No, no, I, I'm going to come back to you, Michael, and say, do you know anything more? My interest is in, in the iron castings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, you know, <laughs> do you know anything more about where those castings were made? Um, which iron, was it Bala himself who took responsibility for manufacturing or, or was there a, um, an iron works locally where they were made? Well, they were in the upper Palatinate, in yeah. Oberpfalz, in, in, in northern, northern Bavaria. Uh, and this was a, a very ancient region for iron making. And uh, Bada's blowing engine was introduced in, in one of these iron works, and it immediately improved the, the quality of the cast iron. Uh, I'm not sure whether the in, in, in the in the fountain house uh, the, the air vessels all come from from, from there. Weilhammer. Weilhammer is one place, Bodenhör is another place. Uh, but I'm I'm Quite sure it, it was in the upper Palatinate in, in, in this region where the iron came from. Again, it, it, it's, it's this business that England is seen as having this um, preeminent position at that time in iron working and stuff and associated um, machinery. But when you actually see this machinery, you suddenly realise that, okay, perhaps our position was not so preeminent as we like to think. Um, and that there, were, there was a lot of work being done in Europe, which um, because of the language barriers, the English are not very good at learning other people's language, we struggle with our own on many occasions, um, that we just do not understand um, th how advanced um, parts of Europe were. But that, but like Britain, where the technology was applied to manufacturing, in here we have an example of technology being applied in what we might call the French style, which was for the enjoyment of the ruling class. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the main difference is between private enterprise in England and Britain and state-driven uh, technology in Germany and in France. I think this is the main, the main difference. Yes, well, I, mean, I felt that for many years that basically we have this a dichotomy which exists to this day where England is, is looking very, very much to the private sector, perhaps Europe not to the same extent. Yeah. I mean, this, this goes on in, in, in uh, engineering education. You have in, in France, you have Ecole Polytechnique and such schools. In Britain, I don't know whether there were similar things. Not nearly as early. Mm. I mean, not nearly as early. After all, the Ecole des Ponts et Chaises in 1747. So mm. it's decades before we did anything here. Yeah. You have the, the famous example that Brunel writes in one of his diaries um, 
a very, very scathing attack. Brunel is, has been in France, he's been trained in France, he comes back to work in England, and he gives a very scathing attack on um, somebody who writes to him about how their son should be educated as an engineer, and basically he says, well, they should basically learn to do it manually. So Britain has always had a slight problem with the education of engineers. So <laughs> 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 I can continue this all evening, it's a theme I enjoy. <laughs> and except that, I mean, the French, and I guess what from what you were saying the Germans, but I, it's the French that I know about, had this absolutely wonderful technical <coughs> engineering education throughout the 18th century, and then it became even more technical when Morsch founded the École Polytechnique in the 1790s, I'm going to say, sort of. But the really good students were sent to Britain in order to study what they called l'esprit d'association, which I translate as, you're sent to sit at the feet of the master and hope that his genius will fall upon you. <laughs> which of course rounded off their education very well, whereas in Britain they sat at the feet of the master and hoped that you know, it would sort of, the genius would fall upon them without really doing the sort of theoretical side. It's a really interesting, I mean the English are so stuffy about technical German and French education. And I mean, I think there's an argument to be made that it's one of the reasons that, you know, by the early 20th century, we've fallen so far behind. That's all that we need to do. Does anybody else want to add on this or? Yes, sorry. Sorry, it's a three-year-old. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, think Julia's right, but I think the, the thing is, it's not England, it's also Scotland, and that regard is really interesting. Uh, the father uh, went to um, Edinburgh, and I presume he went to Edinburgh originally to study medicine, because Edinburgh was a place like mine, was, was the leading European oh, yeah. medical school, and then somehow he got diverted because of black, and black taught chemistry, so I'm not quite clear how he switched careers from, because he spent quite a lot of time studying medicine after all, and he sort of turned his back on that and thought, well, I'll do engineering, I've been to Scott Edinburgh, I'm just trying, trying to work out why he made that really interesting career move, because I can't think many people could have made that at the time. I think, um it, it is uh, to, 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 to a good deal uh, due to Bader's father. Bader's father was a, 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 a court, a, a doctor at the court, and he wanted that his sons, uh, Joseph and Franz uh, Bader, uh, the theologian, uh, they both should become doctors. So they studied originally medicine, in England, that both got uh, doctorates in medicine, uh, both changed their careers into other fields, and when when Bader first moved to Göttingen, to Lichtenberg, uh, I guess he uh, presented this to his father as a further education in medicine because uh, the disciplines were not so sharply. Uh, differentiated at, at that time. Uh, I think he could easily uh, demonstrate to his father that Lichtenberg's lectures and other lectures in, in, in Göttingen were good for his medical uh, education. And the same is true for uh, Edinburgh, when, when he moved to Edinburgh. I think for at least one year or so, uh, father could have presented to his father what he is doing in, in Edinburgh is uh, educating himself furthermore in, 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 in medicine. Well, I mean, that's absolutely right, because I mean, that, that's the faculty that was it. I mean, that taught chemistry to medical students. And I mean, you just sort of look through the list of students studying um, medicine uh, under Black. Most of them go on and practice medicine in one form or another. Not many of them become engineers, and that's that, that, sort, of, that mm. sort of switch. What is it, what is it that Black teaches Varda that makes him want to move from medicine to a job, other than annoying his father, which is quite big. Could, could it have been Robinson? It could be Robinson, yeah. 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 Because at that time, you've got them, they were doing the chemical works down at Preston Pans and things like that, so perhaps it was, it was he had a, a commercial bent and he drifted in that direction. Yeah, but, the, the, but the point is that there are, 
are lots of people from overseas going to study on the black. Very few of them become engineers. Yes. That's that's yeah. the that's pre pre literature. Pre literature. Yeah. I forgot to mention one one episode which has to do with Preston Hans. Uh, there was one man from from originally from Austria and then uh, he was in France and then he came also to Edinburgh. Swediaver. Uh, his name was Swediaver. I have not found much literature about him. Originally he was an Austrian and he also was a doctor in medicine, but he must have been very rich and he wanted to uh, become an industrialist and he uh, bought some parts of Preston Buns and wanted to install new uh, new facilities for uh, salt making yeah. and uh, Bart uh, went to Preston Pans and invented, this must have been his very first invention, invention in quotation marks, a very simple mechanism how human, uh, the force of the human body can be more effective uh, when connected to, uh, to pumps. So he made a drawing how, how the body moves forward and backward on a, a, a bipet. Yes, <coughs> it, it's a very simple mechanical uh, thing, not really a new invention. But Bada makes a, a, a small publication about this. And the man behind this was Swedior, and Swedior, I think, was also. Uh, I'm not sure, but I have this impression from what I read. Uh, he had some connection with the current. Uh, uh, the name I just can't see how it's spelled. I think you need to write the name. Down. It's, it, it, it's, it's spelled in different ways. Yeah. Uh, then it's spelled in, in, in Austrian, <coughs> then it's Schwedia, with S C H. And when I think when he was in France, he called himself Schwedia, or, or, or in England. Because can I can I put in a request? Since I would like to London meetings, would you like to come back? Would you come back and do us a paper on Reichenbach? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's really good for us to know all what is going on, and the fact that Reichenbach is doing those beautiful drawings of a boat and on what engine. I mean, do we know that? Did we know that Barney came and Reichen Bach came to Bolton and what? No. I think we should use yeah. them. Would you do that? Uh, it would be marvelous for us. Perhaps, perhaps what we need. But perhaps we 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 we're probably jumping the gun now. What we should really ask Michael to do right. is is to write his paper up so we can have it in transaction. Oh, it's really all we've done. Do you want to do that, Barney? <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Yes, I think it is. I thought that's a general idea. You're going to give us the paper so we can have it. I mean, this is really new stuff. I would like to. Yes. Um, I was interested in your um, the picture you showed of uh, Port Marley and the, the water wheels are only the same. Um, did they, in fact, change to uh, Barton's uh, pumping at that, or did it stay just so when Pauline was interested? Do you know yes. what I'm Oh, this is a long story. <laughs> there were, I think, since 1780 or so, so about 100 years after the, the building of the machine in Marly, uh, there were always plans to renew this machine. Everyone knew that it, it was terribly... Uh, Upward uh, and and not 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 very good, and Pony uh, also was involved with, with with the commission to renew the machine in Lavalli, and there were made plans and plans and plans for for years, and uh, most plans never materialized, and in the end they uh, they, they used a steam engine uh, to renew the machine. So this was in 1820 or so, I'm, 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 I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. But even then the story of the machine in Marie was not finished. So there, there is a, 
a, a very detailed account of, of, of this story in, 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 in French. Barbi, uh, I think Barbi is, 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 is the author of this uh, treatise. And of course, there's the connection as well there uh, to Mali again through Wilkinson. Um, and the supply of pipes to Mali and what may or may not have been guns as well. Yes, <laughs> of course, we didn't even explore the Wilkinson connection. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, unless we've got any more comments, um, perhaps now is a good time to draw things together. And can we show our appreciation of what I think is the <laughs>